Skeleton Crew by Paul Finch. Read by Rula Lenska. The fact that John Stroud, a professional stick-up man and deranged killer, had escaped that day did not exactly fill the relief section sergeant with enthusiasm for night turn. Lucy Ermston had 16 productive years in the job. Being a female officer, she'd had to get used to direct challenges and now took great pride in her mental and physical toughness. Even she would admit, however, that the thought of a man like John Stroud on the loose was unnerving. He'd busted out of Pentonville that afternoon, taking the lives of two prison guards in the process. With a national APB out for him and tactical support units on a constant 24-hour sweep, everyone reckoned he'd be on his way to some safe house by now, with a view to leaving the country as soon as possible. Lucy knew Stroud, though. She also knew that on this night of the week in particular, Wednesday, the subdivision would have its lowest overnight staffing level. And it was this Nick, of all Nicks, that John Stroud had a particular bone to pick with. Because this insignificant little East End manor was the place where he'd finally been run to ground and subsequently sent away for six life sentences. Not by the uniform reliefs, of course, but by a special firearms team set up for the job. Somewhat inevitably, though, those monkeys were no longer around. Ages back they'd been dispersed to their units, leaving somebody else to cop it. Which was what worried Lucy. Aside from Sergeant Claymore in the custody suite, there'd be one man on the front desk and only three others on patrol. And that would be it. A regular skeleton crew. CAD was located in the divisional HQ eight miles away, Night crime would be on call, but had two other subdivisions to patrol, while traffic and dogs would also be spread thinly over a much wider area than usual. And the duty officer was on leave. If only the underworld knew. What if they did know? What if John Stroud knew? Lucy tried to play things down as she briefed everyone in the parade room at five minutes to ten. What there was of the relief wasn't exactly ideal for this sort of crisis. Jerry Taylor had huge jug ears and a foolish grin, which made him look less like a police constable than anyone else she'd ever seen. Invariably, he landed the front desk job, where hooligans wouldn't be as tempted to take the mickey out of him. The remainder consisted of WPC Justine Farewell, a tall, Teutonic blonde who worked hard, but who Lucy still had reservations about. What kind of policewoman seriously went on duty in lustrous silk stockings and spent hours beforehand with her makeup? And PC's Tony Maddock and Gary Grimes. The former was an experienced street man, burly and bullish, with big shoulders and a heavy black beard, the sort who'd try to boss every conversation, even with his gaffers, especially if they happened to be female. Grimes, on the other hand, was the baby of the relief, a 24-year-old probationer who still turned up for work with ridiculously short haircuts, gleaming boots and razor creases in his pants. He was the one Lucy really worried about. To a man like John Stroud, he'd be easy meat. It may sound like a cliché, but we're going to have to be extra vigilant tonight, she told them as they filed out of the parade room. I'll keep running checks on all of you. Don't forget to test your radios properly before you go out. We're staying in constant touch. Justine took the area panda, Maddock the subdivisional van. Lucy herself checked out the supervision car. Grimes would be walking alone on the precinct area. It was by far the most vulnerable spot for break-ins, so a foot patrol was regarded as vital on nights. That was the loneliest beat of the lot, but it had to be covered. Before she went out, Lucy popped into the custody suite and had a quick word with Sergeant Claymore. He was over fifty, vast of girth, and had a huge, shaggy beard. If his dishevelled appearance didn't immediately proclaim that he was counting down the hours to retirement, his attitude did. As always, he was agog with indifference. So if we get any bodies in tonight, Joe, yourself and Jerry will have to make do, Lucy was saying. 
I want everyone else out and about. Claymore leaned on his hand and gazed at her over the charge office counter. His expression was sleepy with disinterest. He was another one who she knew had little time for women in the job, especially if they made sergeant. As she walked out of the station, Lucy had never felt so bereft of able-bodied support. She spent the next couple of hours cruising around the subdivision, however, closely eyeing the decayed structures of the flats and tenements. It was a bombed-out sprawl. She couldn't think of plainer terms to describe it in. A concrete jungle covered in litter and graffiti, which gave out here and there to vast areas of wasteland strewn with demolition rubble. Lucy was an East End girl herself, born and raised in Hackney. She'd never known things this bad, though, even when the slums had been teeming. Tough, yes, but never like this. An empty wilderness of tunnels, walkways, and trash-strewn courts. Eleven o'clock came and went uneventfully. Then half past. Midnight arrived, however, and Lucy began to wonder at the silence on the air. Even Wednesday nights weren't normally this quiet. Eventually she called up Grimes and told him to meet her at the south end of the precinct. He was waiting there when she pulled up. She parked out of sight, then they walked slowly together between the endless ranks of metal-grilled shop fronts, their leather soles clicking on the cement footpaths. As always, Grimes was nervous in the presence of his section sergeant and answered her questions in broken monosyllables. She glanced up at him. He was a tall lad, well-built in a rangy sort of way, but he constantly had the look of a startled rabbit about him. He was starting to turn sallow in the cheek as well. And it was still only midnight. Lucy sighed inwardly. It took some people a long time to acclimatise to bobbying. It took certain people forever. An hour later, when she finally drove off again, she was far from happy about leaving Grimes alone. He'd walked the precinct dozens and dozens of times since he'd left the company of his tutor constable, but tonight she felt he was a sitting target. The entire subdivision seemed to be deserted, however, and after brief meetings with Maddock and Justine, Lucy returned to the Nick and went into the local intelligence office, where she dug out the files on John Stroud. They were extensive. A lean, weaselly face glared out at her from his most recent mugshot. His fair hair greased back in strands, his cheeks both crisscrossed with old razor cuts. His form seemed to go back into criminal history and was exclusively violent. And he was no respecter of sex, either. What he'd once done to a prison psychiatrist who dared turn her back on him made Lucy shudder. She remembered the night they'd brought him into the station. She'd been a WPC at the time, helping out in the charge office. He'd come in quietly enough, inevitable with ten armed plain clothes guys around him, but they said he'd already taken a few people out and would have to be watched like a hawk. He was tall, but also lean and very fit. His face was indescribably brutal, but she remembered them saying that his main asset was his cunning. He had hundreds of aliases, was a master of disguise and a top-notch escaper. Talk about Category A. She replaced the files, turned the light off, and closed the door behind her. After all that, it was a relief to get back out on the streets. The night had dragged on and a few odd jobs were dribbling in. Justine had been sent to a burglary on the far side of the subdivision, but Maddock was dealing with an intruder in the hospital grounds, which sounded ominous. Lucy got her foot down. The massive Gothic shape of the hospital was silent and sat in obsidian darkness. Lucy found the PC at the rear of it, strolling across one of the lawned areas, the van parked up close by. She picked him out from a distance by the strong beam of his torch. I'll radio for you, Sarge, he told her as she approached. But CAD said you were off the air. Couldn't raise you. Yeah, I was busy, she muttered. Thought you wanted to keep in contact tonight. Yes, I do, Tony, but as I say, I was busy. I was back in the nick. Anyway, what have we got? Maddox shrugged his big shoulders. 
Druggies, probably. No trace of damage or a break. Don't see what interest our Mr Stroud would have here. She looked sharply at him. Just for a second she'd fancy there was some mockery in that voice. But the face under the flat hat was as grim and saturnine as always. More so in the half-darkness. Well, let's not take any chances, eh? she said, setting off back to the supervision car. Keep in touch. Grimes and Maddock were due for their refreshments at two, and she saw them both making their way into the station as she drove past. Justine was proving more elusive, however. Of the three constables, she was having the busier night of it. So far, she'd taken two crime reports and dealt with a domestic. Lucy finally found her in the underpass. It was pitch black down there, and the panda's headlights came out through the murk like two luminous eyes. The vehicle slowed down as they passed each other. Both women wound down their windows. "'Morning, Sergeant,' said Justine in that clipped, efficient tone of hers. Lucy nodded. "'Anything?' Justine shook her head. "'Quiet as the grave.' "'Love the terminology, Jus,' said Lucy. OK, on three o'clock refs. You'll be on your tod, I'm afraid. The other two are inside now.' The WPC shrugged. Lucy couldn't imagine the tall blonde finding the company of either Maddock or Grimes all that appealing at this hour of the morning anyway. "'Keep your eyes open, love,' she said, before pulling slowly away. She circled the subdivision for the next two hours or so, sticking close to the boundaries, occasionally passing the precinct, knowing how vulnerable it would be with the town centre man on his break. There was now a fresh autumn wind blowing, which smelled like rain. Ordinarily, bad weather was a godsend on nights. It tended to keep the scum indoors. On this occasion, however, she was cursing it. If only it was the middle of June instead of the back end of October... Dawn would be breaking just about now, throwing lovely bright sunlight over everything, instead of total, all-enveloping darkness like this. She was halfway up Galloway Hill when she fancied she saw a figure standing at the top of a flight of steps. She braked abruptly and reversed down the empty street. When she reached the steps, however, there was nobody on them. They were hemmed in on both sides by dense bushes and ran up to another sprawling council estate. Lucy sighed. She knew that she had no option but to walk up and have a look. If it wasn't Stroud, it could be someone dogging out for a burglary. She'd better at least check. She parked, collected her torch and radio, and went stealthily up. At the top there was flat ground and row after row of concrete mezzanettes. Many were boarded up, the paved areas around them strewn with litter and broken glass. Right in front of her, though, she found what she'd taken to be the figure. An iron pillar was all that remained of a railing which had once ran down the middle of the steps. Several rags had caught round it and were now billowing out. Lucy stood there for a moment, looking at it. Above her head, clouds were scudding across the moon. The wind was sighing through the barren canyons of the flats. For the first time that night, she began to wonder if she was going about any of this the right way. She turned and looked out over the subdivision. What on earth reason would John Stroud have to be sneaking around this desolate place? If she was him, what would she be doing at this particular moment? Logic insisted that by now she'd be as far from London as was humanly possible. But logic rarely came into it with maniacs like Stroud. Assuming he really was out there hoping to get some copper, what exactly would he be doing right now? She considered his attributes. He was vicious, clever, resourceful. He was also a professional. He rarely left things to chance. In which case he would hardly be prowling the benighted streets like some brain-dead urban Apache taking potluck. He'd have an agenda. A plan. And if she was John Stroud, that plan would send her around the place where his targets least expected trouble, where they were most relaxed and therefore most vulnerable. Unable to seriously believe what she was now thinking, 
Lucy turned her gaze southwards in the direction of the police station. She drove back there in double-quick time and consulted her watch as she pulled into the yard. It was just past four, the quietest part of the night. Grimes and Maddock would have been back out on patrol for an hour. Justine would be on the verge of finishing her refs. Lucy might just be able to catch her. They'd search the nick together. There'd be no need to even disturb Claymore and Taylor down in custody. She made her way in through the personnel door, and almost immediately it struck her what a rabbit warren the average police station could be, especially when deserted and standing in darkness like this. There were only three floors in this particular building, yet each one was a maze of rooms and passages, all now filled with shadows, or lit faintly in dim spectral stripes, street lighting filtering in through the Venetian blinds. In this immediate area alone, There'd be lavatories and a locker room to search, the CID office and admin department, the DI and DCI's personnel offices, the stationery and photocopy room, street thefts, the area suite, a locker room, lavatories and showers. Doors seemed to open off on all sides of her, each leading into blackness. There was a stony silence. Lucy shook her head. She was overreacting badly. Surely Stroud couldn't have got into the building, even if he'd wanted to. The only access was by two doors. The personnel door at the side, which required a key code known only to staff, and the front door, which had an electronic lock on it and could only be opened if the front desk buzzed it open. There were plenty of windows, of course, but they were all securely alarmed. Then again, John Stroud wasn't the sort of man to balk at alarms or secret key codes. He'd got round both in the past, with ease. She made her way quickly along the ground floor corridor and paused beside the door to the front desk. There was no sound, either from in there or the custody suite on the other side of it. In the absence of prisoners or customers, Claymore and Taylor were probably taking the opportunity to have a doze. Well, that was fine. It would keep them out of her hair. Lucy strolled past and went up the stairs to the first floor. She turned at the top and walked down the corridor towards the canteen. The door was open at the far end, and she could see the distant shape of Justine standing by the microwave table, pulling on her tunic. Lucy was about to hail her when three things suddenly hit her all at once. The door to the television room was open. The light was turned off inside... A man was sitting in one of the armchairs, very still. Lucy froze in her stride. Immediately she flattened herself against the wall. She had only glanced into the room as she'd passed, but even in the darkness she'd distinctly seen the outline of a figure in the facing armchair. Suddenly her heart was going ten to the dozen. Justine! She hissed sharply. In the corner of her eye, she saw the WPC look round in the canteen. In here! The sergeant whispered, motioning at the television room. Her gaze was locked on the open doorway and the darkness flowing out of it. She sensed, rather than saw, Justine come quickly down the corridor towards her. Lucy waited a second, then sprang. She had no truncheon, but she did have a heavy-duty torch which she'd used as a weapon on more than one occasion, and holding it over her right shoulder, she dashed into the small room, stabbing out with her left hand and turning the light on. And for a split second, she couldn't take in what she was seeing. There was a figure in the armchair, but it was Gary Grimes, and he appeared to be fast asleep, his head lolling on his shoulder, Tony Maddock was also in there in another armchair, and he also was sleeping. And what about Sergeant Claymore and Jerry Taylor? They were on the opposite side. Their heads were lolling, too. Lucy hardly knew what she was seeing. She felt Justine come up behind her and heard a sharp intake of breath. Almost without realising what she was doing, knowing that she was on the verge of shrieking, the sergeant reached out blindly for the WPC's hand. She took it, but it felt cold and flabby and limp. Lucy looked slowly down. She had taken Justine's hand all right, only Justine was slumped in the armchair beside the door, naked. 
Lucy never had a chance to cry out. The silk stocking round her neck put paid to that.